We humans tend to be monogamous, and that puts us in a minority of only 10% among mammals, because mammals are a promiscuous bunch. It's that gestation period of weeks or even months. By the time mammal babies finally emerge, the male responsible is nothing more than a misty memory in mother mammal's mind. He'd have been no help nursing them anyway. And for 90% of mammals, nursing is pretty much all there is to it. There's no need to do so much as potty train them, much less teach them to brush their teeth and say please and thank you. But among birds, it's different. The female lays eggs within a day or two, so the male who courted her hasn't strayed anywhere, and either sex can care for the young. It makes sense, then, that the percentages are reversed. About 90% of birds practice some version of monogamy. Bluebirds belong in that 90%. Almost all of them mate for life. They're cavity nesters, and on account of that, the species went into a steep decline in the 20th century because they depended on using old woodpecker holes, and people kept cutting down the dead trees. Then on top of that, the larger, more aggressive house sparrows and starlings, which had arrived from Europe and multiplied aggressively here, wanted those same holes. But in the last quarter of the 20th century, a widespread campaign to put up bluebird houses halted the species' spiral toward extinction. Bluebirds took to man-made cavities with gusto, despite the lack of tree bark for giving their claws purchase on the wood. Unfortunately, house sparrows shared their enthusiasm for the boxes. So the further you can place a bluebird house from a human structure, the more leaving alone it will get from house sparrows. Early in the season, check the box once a week and throw out any house sparrow nests you find. The female bluebird does most of the nest building, starting with a base of twigs and pine needles. Would somebody please hand her a little bluebird-sized hatchet so she can get those short-leaf pine needles through that hole? She finishes the nest with soft grasses, feathers, and hairs. Once the bluebirds have eggs, you can put up what's called a magic halo to keep the house sparrows from trying to evict them. The bluebird adults will brave the fishing line to get to their young. But you might want to take the magic halo down once the nestlings fledge, lest you find one of them swinging in it like a startled Tarzan. House sparrows are usually as leery of the fine strands as they would be of spiderweb strands. Maybe they can't tell the difference. They are nearsighted. And perhaps, not being bug eaters, they're touchy about spiders. Bluebirds, on the other hand, zero in on spiders and eat them. You see, bluebirds are perch and drop insect hunters, a way of earning their living that requires keen eyesight. And they would no more confuse monofilament line for a spider web than they would try to eat a nail as if it were a caterpillar. The bluebird style of catching insects is unusual among songbirds. Those species that eat mostly bugs generally flit and catch their quarry on the wing rather than perching and waiting for it. But despite their unorthodox strategy for catching insects, bluebirds manage to eat lots of them. Bugs are 80% of a bluebird's diet, close to 100% of it in warm weather. In cold weather, they'll eat berries, but in summer, they want bugs. And bugs are 100% of what their babies get. The nestlings don't need their meat roasted, pan-fried, deep-fried, sautéed, steamed, poached, grilled, breaded, fricasseed, or microwaved. They like their bugs raw, thank you very much, and want caterpillars if they can get them. Caterpillars are a favorite food for songbirds to give their nestlings because they're like hot dogs. They're shaped like hot dogs and they're full of protein. Soft and squishy, easy to shove down the throat of a blind, naked baby who can barely swallow. 
In fact, the parents will gather six or seven thousand caterpillars to raise a single brood. And what's child rearing without diaper duty, right? Shared equally between the parents. They wait around after feedings, knowing that food going in one end of the nestlings often prompts a petite package of poop exiting the other end. The adults want to get rid of the fecal sac, to use the more formal term, before the baby birds have time to squish it and get the nest to smelling like a gas station restroom at the end of Memorial Day weekend. If they didn't do that, the mess would be more than unsanitary. The smell would attract predators. So the parent sits there. If you've ever waited for a toddler on his potty seat, you know the feeling. And about half the time, the wait is for naught. But that's okay, because the other half of the time, the adult emerges with a sack which is made of a mucus so thick and strong that a parent can pick it up in her sharp beak and carry it 20 to 50 yards away without puncturing it. The second and third breeds for the season are increasingly threatened by the hotter summers we're experiencing. The cavities bluebirds used to nest in were in trees and thus shaded usually. But imagine sitting for hours, no, make that broiling for hours, in a box that has about as much ventilation as a railroad car. And that hole doesn't so much cool the box as let the hot sun into a place with no cross breeze. So a friend of mine eased the heat in an unshaded house wren box by rigging the sunscreen for a car windshield over it. Now she knew that it's best to put up something new like that in between broods so as not to stress the adults, but in the middle of a heat wave she chanced it. Bug and beak, the wren sat on the fence, literally and figuratively, for a couple of minutes, looking at her on the patio, then to his house and back at her, before he finally went in. Okay, maybe he was just angling for something that didn't look like the Jodes live there. And there are store-bought options online for keeping birdhouses cooler. Just be aware, if you want a do-it-yourself shade for a box with a brood in it, that birds are going to suspect you of dire intent. For eons, hungry baby birds have popped open their orange maws at feeding time. As they get closer to time for fledging, those little maws are waiting at the door for the food. And the nestlings have gotten big enough to peek out the hole at the wide world waiting for them, at bugs on the wing. They're also old enough to beg for food by fluttering their wings. It's totally unnecessary in the nest box, not like the parents are going to see it from wherever they are or have any trouble noticing them in that cramped space when they return. But it's good exercise for those new wings. And anyway, they're almost ready to fledge. And once they're gone from that predictable location, fluttering will be a critical tool for getting their parents to notice them. Human babies can put up a squall when they need attention, but we humans don't have to be cautious about predators. Fledglings wouldn't dare raise such a hullabaloo. That kind of ruckus could get them killed. Songbirds really do believe that children should be seen, not heard. In any case, within a couple of weeks, even wing fluttering won't do fledglings any good. The adults, busy with another brood, will stop feeding them. And so, soon after they take their first flight, the youngsters must begin their way up a steep learning curve. And the first step is for it to occur to them that the food right in front of them doesn't necessarily have to be passed along in Papa's beak, that they might dare to pick it up for themselves instead of chasing after him. That epiphany comes all the sooner if mealworms are on offer. One of those who have always fed him is gone, yes, but the food is still sitting right there. 
Hmm. And that first step up the curve will be easier for the youngster if the food is sitting still, heaped up in a tray. Take note, those of you who put up bluebird houses. After that first lesson is learned, more difficult ones will follow. Learning to recognize which objects among all the foliage are edible bugs. And then getting good at spotting and catching them. Many thanks to Al and Corey Westcott for giving me access to their backyard to film the bluebirds.